Uh, as you are aware, this is another episode conducted by the Collaborative Learning Cafe. Okay, various topics are being taken where we can illuminate a mind like a lighthouse. Uh, we have a moderator with us, uh, Dolphy D'Souza, who is also project lead Mumbai for Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. He's a social and human rights activist. He's the president of the Bombay Catholic Sabha. He's a, uh, he's a convener of Police Reform Watch, executive member of the People's Union for Civil Liberties, and the member of District Legal Services Authority. He's, a, he's the moderator for today's event, and he will introduce our keynote speaker. Over to you, Dolphy. Good evening, friends, and uh, thank you, Linus. Uh, it's a great opportunity for all of us to learn uh, the expertise of my colleague and friend, Sri Venkatesh Naik, who is currently the director of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, uh, which actually works on two verticals. One is on the issue of access to justice, uh, which is police reforms and prison reforms. And the other one is right to information. Uh, Venkat has been, as we call him, has been a very ardent promoter of the RTI, uh, not only, but across South Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean countries has trained over 6,000 officers of the government, including 600 executives of the public sector enterprises. But has done his doctoral research fellow, fellow in history and authored, if you look at it, practically twice in a week, he's got his articles coming up on right to information in terms of uh, insights into the aspect of governance and various other facets uh, that Venkat is known for, and uh, he has spent his lifetime, in fact, of studying the whole sunshine law and also promoting it very, very vigorously. And I'm very proud to be associated uh, with you, Venkat, for so many years now. And uh, always a pleasure to hear you out on a subject which is very, very dear to you. Over to Venkat. Thank you, Dolphy. Before I start off, uh, uh, be a little bit loud, Venkat, because I think your uh, voice is a little bit uh, soft. Okay. Now I hope things are better. Slightly uh, better, yeah. Uh, let me turn off my video and then perhaps you can try. Is this uh, uh, has this improved? Yeah, this is much. This is this is slightly better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So do let me know in case there is any difficulty with the volume. I'll try and join through my phone. The only reason why I decided to join through my laptop is because uh, if there is a requirement for showing any materials on screen, then I can't do it through my phone. Anyway, so let us see how things go. So a very good evening to all of you, my very dear fellow citizens, activists and advocates of transparency and accountability, and uh, fellow journeymen, journey to make our country a better governed place. It's a pleasure to be uh, back with the Collaborative Learning Cafe. I remember sometime last year, we had another interaction. Uh, of course, Dolphy and I are colleagues, um, Fred, uh, Linus, uh, and uh, Remedius. We are all people who've been, um, you know, struggling to make the government a mic volume to the maximum. Uh, are people still having difficulties listening to me? Okay, now it seems okay. Great, great. Still uh, soft. I don't know why. Ah. No, I don't know how to remedy it because if I get off the laptop, then I won't be able to show anything on screen. Uh, That's the challenge. Can you can you disconnect the headphones and just try once? No, then my laptop doesn't work. Uh, oh. The audio just doesn't carry through. I, I, I mean, you can give it a try. I am disconnecting now. Disconnect my headphones, then you can't hear me at all. 
At least now I think you are able to hear to some extent. We can't hear you. Are you are you speaking? Yeah, yeah I am speaking. Now can yeah. you hear me? Still, still soft. One second. Let me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now it's at maximum. Is this better? Marginally better. I hope everybody is able to hear me now. Zoom things work much better. I don't know why. Google Meet was absolutely fine a couple of weeks ago. I don't know why suddenly there is a problem with the volume. Okay. Uh, so I hope at least it might be soft, but are you at least able to hear me? Okay. Now, uh, Savio is saying much better. Yeah, it is much, much better now. Uh, but Mr. Dilip Nayak is not able to hear. Fred is able to hear. So probably there's a connectivity issue at your end, uh, Mr. Nayak. Please check. Because at least four people are telling me that they're able to hear me loud and clear. Okay. Okay. So let me continue without yeah, any further. This is better. Ado. This is better. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, let me start with a question just to uh, share my first experience. And perhaps that can kickstart today's discussion, which is uh, primarily on. You know, the kinds of challenges that there are, uh, which we face in order to access information. And I want to actually present before you my latest challenge. And we can start from there. So let me first ask a question. How many of you are not rice eaters? Turn on your video or uh, raise your hand. Those who are rice eaters, if you don't do it, we'll assume that you are rice eaters. But those who are not rice eaters, please raise your hand. Okay, Sharmila is not a rice eater. Uh, Tony is not a rice eater. John Lobo is not a rice eater. Okay, anybody else who is not a rice eater? Okay, so that shows that a majority of us are rice eaters. Uh, no comment at all about our um gastronomical habits that is not the purpose of my asking this question the reason I'm, uh, you know i asked this question is simply this about two weeks ago i filed an rti application uh no this was about almost a month ago i asked a question with the director general of foreign trade you know the dgft as they call them that's the office which issues gazette notifications about India's export and import policy. And they also keep track of India's exports to other countries and imports from other countries that come into our market. So about a month ago, you will all remember that all of a sudden, out of the blue, government of India through the DGFT issued a public um, press note. They said, henceforth, India will be banning export of all non-Basmati rice. Everybody was shocked. Those of us who are right, right, you know, happy, saying that, oh yes, of course, the government is very careful. Uh, it looks like this year's monsoon, because of the El Nino effect, may not really contribute to a bountiful rice crop. Uh, in the Kharif season. <coughs> so, in case the market decides to jump high and the price of rice goes skywards, then people will be in difficulty. So, it's a great thing that India has imposed the complete ban or export of non Basmati kinds of rice. Now, now, there aren't too many of us who can afford to read, eat basmati on a daily basis, obviously. Yeah, I certainly don't. I don't think I even eat basmati rice even once a year or so. It's way too expensive. So it's just a regular rice that most of us eat. But then came the fallout. What was the fallout? The fallout was, even I didn't know this, 40% of the rice that is consumed around the world in countries like Africa, Latin America, Europe, 
Gulf countries, 40 percent of the world's wheat, or, or, sorry, or, or rice consumption is supplied by India. Okay. So, in addition to us, there is Vietnam, there is Malaysia. I think even to some extent, Laos also is a rice exporting country, but climate change has affected their rice output, their rice yield. So they are also in difficulty. But thankfully, we haven't run into difficulty yet. And that was even before the um, rice export ban was imposed. Justification was given in the press bureau, press information bureau note as to why the government of India imposed this ban. And they said that, look, despite the fact that we were imposing price control and making it more expensive to export rice outside, compared to previous years, the amount of rice, non-Basmati rice that is being exported out of India has grown phenomenally. This is abnormal. And there was also justification saying that there's a lot of holding that is going on because of these reasons. Therefore, we impose the ban. Fair enough. Now, I'm sure even if you are not a rice eater, if you have an inquisitive mind, you would want to ask, okay, let's get hold of the records on the basis of which government of India has imposed this ban on the export of non-Basmati rice. And that was the first instance. Huh? So I filed an RTI application with the Director General for the Trade because they were the ones who issued that notification saying, henceforth, no export of non-Basmati rice. They took their own sweet time to reply. And finally, they got back to me and said that a committee of ministers has made this decision not to export uh, non-Basmati rice and we are implementing it and we have imposed this, so we have issued this notification. We don't have any other record. I thought, wow, this is interesting. So they are just like a Akashwani Durdarshan which simply announces to the people, hey look, non-Basmati rice export stopped and here is a notification. But what they did was they told me that according to information that DGFT got from the Department of Consumer Affairs, which is part of the Ministry of you know, Food and Consumer Affairs, as you all know. So they have said, Committee of Ministers has taken this decision. So, okay. Now I'm not going to challenge this in appeal saying that, no, you have to give me this information. If you're saying you don't have information, fine, I'll take it at face value. So I filed my second RTA three weeks ago with the Department of Consumer Affairs, which is part of the Ministry of Food and Public Distribution, as you all know. And I asked, by that time, what had happened? They started imposing, government of India started imposing even more controls on the export of Basmati rice also. They said you cannot export anything which is priced less than 1200 rupees per ton. And there were some more, you know, one more uh, uh, notification was there with regard to uh, export control on rice. So both Basmati and non-Basmati rice had now come under some sort of a regulation of the government. So it was not like earlier that they had free export depending upon existing rules and regulations. No, there are lots, lots of control. And by that time, news started trickling in from Africa, from Gulf countries, from other countries saying how there is panic in many of these countries. Africa, for example, in Uganda, in Kenya, they are rice eaters. Suddenly, market prices of rice, retail prices have shot up like anything. Poor people are uh, dependent on rice exports from India. So clearly, even though we might benefit from it, which is fair enough, our government has a first responsibility to look after its citizens. Fair enough. I'm not questioning that. But tell us, what was the basis for doing this? So what were my questions? I said, give me a copy of the cabinet note that was put before the committee of ministers. Give me a copy of the materials that you used you know, you would have had some inputs, no? Suddenly, if this price is going up locally, suddenly if there is holding, that information would have come from somewhere. So give me a copy of that. And then, this is from people saying that, look, rice prices are likely to go through the sky. So make sure that our stocks are all well protected. So these are basically documents that will explain in government files 
the data, the information, and the process of arriving at this decision to introduce export control or ban on various kinds of rice. I didn't say, give me this information, even though while explaining I said so. Nowadays, what I do is this. Most of the information that I ask in nine out of 10 cases, nine out of 10 RTI applications that I find, I say that, look, this is information that you should be proactively disclosing under section 41. And I ask only for that kind of information in nine out of 10 cases. It should be um, disclosed either under section 41B or 41C or 41D. You are all aware what these provisions are. They're all about proactive and routine information disclosure without waiting for people to ask for it. So I said under 41B, 41C, 41D, read with 42. What is 42? 42 says very clearly in the RTI Act, make sure that every public authority puts out information as much as possible so that people's need for filing RTIs is progressively reduced. People don't have to file RTIs. You put information out in the public domain, so motto or voluntarily, and let people access it. Now that is what is real transparency. Transparency is not about Venkatesh Naik filing an RTI and getting the information and telling the whole world. Transparency is that the government tells everybody, look, this is where the information is. You can go and access it. So the work of the public information officer is also reduced. So that is how I drafted my second RTI and I filed it online with the Department of Consumer Affairs. You would be surprised to know what happened to that RTI. But I know what, you know where it is going. Consumer Affairs in less than 24 hours sent it to Food Corporation of India. You all know what Food Corporation of India does. It's basically the government's public sector enterprise, which does market operations to ensure that A, poor people are able to get rice through the ration shops at subsidized prices. So they do the procurement and supply it to the ration shops. The second thing is they do open market operations. So whenever they watch and see that the price of rice available in the retail market for people like you know all of us who don't go to ration shops or don't have a necessity of going to ration shops, where we might be able to buy rice at market prices. So when the prices go beyond a certain level of comfort, then F uh, food, food Corporation of India releases its stock into the market. So then the prices start coming down. So then holders who will go to a temple or to a church or to a mosque and you know uh, bow before God and ask for expiation of their sins on a daily, weekly, fortnightly or you know, festival dependent basis, they have no qualms holding even basic foodstuffs to, in order to make money. So in order to frustrate those kinds of attempts, the Food Corporation of India indulges in what is called undertakes open market operations and releases its stock so that the price gets stabilized. So obviously Food Corporation of India might have the information that I'm asking. So it was transferred to them and said, okay, good, let it come. You would be surprised to know the very same day, Food Corporation of India sent the same RTI back to whom? Back to the Department of Consumer Affairs. You thought, wow, why did they send it to the Food Corporation of India in the first place? So I waited because I was busy with something else. So I didn't want to challenge anything. One day later, Consumer Affairs sent some RTI back to Food Corporation of India. You thought, okay, Wait, so this is becoming an interesting game of soccer. And then, what did Food Corporation of India do? They sent it once again back to the Department of Consumer Affairs. Now this time, thankfully, today's uh, update is the latest that I have. Now Department of Consumer Affairs has not sent it a third time to Food Corporation of India. They have now sent it to D Department of Food Dis and Public Distribution, DOFPD. So DOFPD or Food and Public Distribution Department is the one that is responsible for implementation of the National Food Security Act. I'm waiting for a response. Just before I joined this meeting, I said, let me up, you know, let me download all the status updates. Who has transferred my RTI to whom? With such great, uh, you know, such great and alarm. So let us see what the response is. So this is where things start. I don't know tomorrow where it's going to be, you know, move further. Thankfully, it has now gone to a specific PIO whose name I know. Now, why am I narrating this story? Now, if this is the experience that a person 
who is a citizen of india has with the central government agency which is supposed to be one of the best governed of systems in the country as compared to state governments or you know or district level administration or panchayat level administration central government is generally known to be a lot more efficient or a lot more digitalized or a lot more uh, um, rule based norm based and also public interaction with the central government departments is very minimal except in the context of some of the line ministries so they ought to do a better job but no they are playing soccer with my idea so what is it that people would be facing at the state government level district administration level taluka level police departments panchayats i would not be surprised at all this is just an example of the kind of the you know it's it's, it's, a, it's an example of the kind of attitude within government towards transparency even after 17 years of implementation of rti now why am i saying this the reason is this two things should have happened when i filed my first rti the public information officer or dgft after saying that okay it's a committee of ministers which has taken this decision should have transferred my rti to them instead of saying we don't have any further information so under section 63 they have not done their job now they didn't do that job there is a problem there apart from the fact that they didn't do their job and now that problem which i haven't explained yet but that becomes more manifest when my second rti is doing the rounds of krishi bhavan and food corporation of india office which is near august kanti bhavan i think what is that and that second problem is non compliance with section 41b of the right to information act and okay now they're saying raise my volume i'm keeping it at maximum above this my lap it's at 100 so beyond this you know, i just can't increase the volume so i hope you know you will excuse me for this so what these public authorities should have done is they should have strictly adhered to section 41a which is records management and 41b to disclosure and 41c which is routine disclosure what does 41c say whenever you are taking or announcing important policy decisions make all the facts about those policy decisions publicly available so that people don't have to ask for it formally none of this was done therefore people like me have to remind the government saying don't give me the information who am i by god's grace even if you don't give me the information tomorrow i will be able to go to a rice store and buy some rice feed myself and my family so getting the information you know it doesn't really influence my ability to eat rice but people in this country have a right to know especially when you are go, you know when you are having a g20 summit in this country and you spend 4100 crores as if they were peanuts on just having that jamboree and you had the african union president coming over and and he was one of the number of people that our honorable prime minister was hugging that's not enough that's not uh, what international relations is all about international relations also is about the responsibility of ensuring that the kind of decisions that you take do not have a deleterious effect if they do not have an adverse effect on something as basic as the food which should be on the plates of hungry people international relations needs to be conducted with a lot more wisdom than we are ever known to have conducted in the last 75 years i am not critical of just this government even earlier also we had these problems so people have the right it's not just about rti my friends is not just about our concerns as indians about what is happening inside india if we truly want to be global act globally and think locally i say please think so we have a right to know because obviously we can't reverse the policy but at least let us tell people let us inform was there no other option available 
could be probably you know like for example i am reminded of the days when uh, the late lal bahadur shastri was the prime minister of the country we were in dire straits our agricultural sector was in terrible shape and we had to fight that war with china so what did he recommend those of you uh, who are pretty young and of my age you may not remember but those who are older than i you will remember i have heard this from my parents he actually made a public broadcast saying that we don't have enough food grains in this country we need to feed our soldiers because they are fighting a very difficult war their supply chains have to be kept absolutely strong so can we fast once a week can we forego a meal once a week people did that they did forego a meal so no prime minister is saying and it's not as simple as saying that okay in order to drive away corona shall we beat thalis no let's keep the thalis empty for one meal is what lal bahadur shastri said and that's not all women came forward to give their jewelry to support the cause of war thousands of women came forward and not just the rich ones even middle class and the lower class um, the, the, the impoverished class people who didn't really have much in terms of savings but some ancestral heirlooms or you know jewelry might have been there they went forward and gave that also today we have a duty to think globally because we are a like a global village so let us at least start asking these questions ki okay, what is it that has happened that required a complete ban on non basmati type of rice and you expect the other countries that are affected by this to be very friendly with us but the market give us business opportunities to sell our stuff are you stop selling something that is so basic that it reaches the food plate of people so the purpose of pointing this out is that look despite having had 17 years of experience of implementing of of using rti having trained thousands of officers as dolphy said we've not been able to bring about much of a change in the attitude of public information officers or appellate authorities or even information commissioners when it comes to transparency it is still like if i will decide whether information should be given to you or not the law is not going to decide our rti act is one of the best in the world top 10 it used to be top 3 now other countries have done better so let's say top 10 if you were to simply implement that law in letter and spirit our should be a much more transparent government at all levels they don't want to do that so if that is the case then what is that you and i can do can we st start writing obituaries to rti for the last 5 years i've only had obituaries to rti rti is dead rti is dying rti is in its last breath oh this amendment came rti will not be effective anymore everybody is writing obituaries but people like you and i continue to use rti we know there are challenges we know the amendment to the uh, rti act that has recently been made to the digital uh, personal data protection act that is going to reduce the scope of the transparency regime much much more but we have to use the law so long as it is there it's like our dear friend uh, former central information commissioner professor shridhar acharya lo said it's a 10 rupee public interest litigation exercise 10 rupees you don't even need to hire a lawyer so we need to question so i think rather we'll read the obituaries that others write but we renew our efforts to open up the government to as much an extent as we can the idea is never give up so long as the law is there we will keep using it in whatever form that they it might be allowed to function the more people use it i am optimistic that we will be able to bring about a change in the manner of uh, treatment of rti in the commitment that governments don't have right now towards transparency let us hope and make that a commitment that actually is visible that becomes visible and that will come only through people's pressure i am not really a person who will write obituaries of rti i might say yes they are weakening it because that is a fact but i will not write an obituary why otherwise we should have written an obituary to our constitution of india in the very second year of implementation why because they amended the fundamental rights chapter through the very first amendment by introducing more and more restrictions on the freedom of speech and expression we shall said oh this constitution is gone or kaam nahi karne wala no it has survived it has helped us survive as one country despite all the fissy paris tendencies in this country it has helped us survive for 75 years that is the one thing that keeps us together it is not the army it is not the police it is that commitment that our our ancestors made 
to democracy to a society based on equality liberty justice and fraternity that is what is keeping us all together even the ones who want to have a majority in form of government they are also making use of the very protections and the very rights that the constitution affords them otherwise they would all be behind bars so when the constitution itself is taking so long in realizing its vision rti will take even longer it's just one tiny law so this is what i wanted to say in my opening remarks now what i would like to do is just keep the floor open if you have a problem with your bandwidth you don't need to turn on your video. please feel free to ask your questions and i'll ha be happy to respond to them we can spend the next one and a half hours or so i mean i say i, I suppose an hour and 20 minutes we have time until 7 o'clock so let us have an interaction i would really appreciate it if you were not uh, to if you wouldn't ask me hypothetical questions but point to real problems that you have faced or that you've heard somebody in your friend circle somebody in your activist fraternity who has faced let's discuss those kinds of issues and in the middle of that depending upon questions that come i will try and show you whatever materials i have that may be of relevance while answering that question so i can see um that uh, there are some questions in the chat box there are people also who have raised hands so let me see, i know take a question that is already in the chat box somebody said can we use social media ha huh. sharmila devas is saying the social media work better than rti to expose the government now what will you put on social media is also a question no ma'am you could certainly put stuff that often comes out of whatsapp university and you know what i'm talking about i don't have to give you details that will take you nowhere unless you're part of the trolling grid but if you were to get information out through rti and use that to express to show a mirror to government i wouldn't want to say expose the government i would say show a mirror to the government look this is what you are telling me you have done show it to the corporation show it to the municipality show it to the panchayat show it to the deputy commissioner's office that this is what you are telling me you have done and we believe this is wrong and use social media for that then your outreach should be really good why am i saying this the reason i'm saying this is today it is becoming more and more difficult to get the print media the electronic media and to some extent the digital media to cover even our simple rti stories yes, we don't want to take it. why because the attitude of the media itself has changed so much in the last few years that many of them because of the kind of pressure under which they work do not want to take the kinds of stories that would hit the headlines 10 years ago 15 years ago it's only g who is items that get highlighted in the media in the conventional media so it is better to use social media and if you have a large network that's a good way of sharing the information that you get through rti with everybody else now what if you don't get the information now just like the story that i said at the beginning of my presentation how my rti is being used to play a game of soccer that also you can fit into 140 characters and you can share it on social media nothing stops you from doing it. so therefore social media is a very powerful tool today please do make use of it and if you have for example in done in some investigative work on your own without using rti but based on your interactions with people in government if you want to put information out about that in the public domain social media is another very good tool please do use it it's a great way of reaching out to people the more we interact the more we dialogue the more we uh, get into conversations with one another the better it is for us to become a stronger more evolved and better governed polity it's not enough to just discuss matters of governance two months before the elections matters of governance should be discussed on a day to day basis and i'm happy to see that on some of the whatsapp groups where i'm a member particularly those leading to goa every day there are governance issues that are being discussed that's amazing that's the power of using social media please please keep it continuing social media has its problems it has its drawbacks but it also has opened up many opportunities for us to engage with each other share information with each other learn from each other and work out 
strategies for improving things in the administration rich discussions i think so that's a very good way of doing it so that's the response i wanted to give to you i don't think there are any other questions in the chat box uh if thank you if there are uh, i think somebody had raised their hand i can't quite see who had raised please benedict fernandes uh, uh mr fernandes please go ahead and raise your question oh, uh, yes, regarding please. yeah we had a sslc scam in the year 2022 okay so where in uh, answer sheets were supplied to students at a place called kodi okay. i from mangalore filed rti application with sslc board okay SS sslc board rejected my rti applications on the ground 81j that is privacy okay so now i have appealed with the state karnataka state election i mean sorry the information commission okay and the first first sentence when i when the case was heard the judge was the judge who is who is sitting he is commenting straight away it is 81j it is privacy mm. Mm. so the see these these big big bosses this director of sslc education board and this karnataka information on the face of it i can look look into it and say that he will not allow my petition but actually there are 14 appeals only two have been heard hmm. uh, now the now for me it is we have to approach the high court yes so if uh, citizens are I mean see 81j is privacy i am not asking any personal information i am asking what the di diary of the invigilator was corrected the paper hmm. the cc camera footage which was uh, recorded at uh, chikodi hmm. so these things only these things 14 rta man, uh, appeals are pending now hmm. so this is the pity now what 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 can i do okay it's a very interesting question and i uh, you know i quite uh, you quite rightly now, one, one, to... one more thing one more thing okay. actually okay. i have asked the government of karnataka to have a police investigation they mm -hmm. have appointed they have instead of police investigation they have direct uh, made a committee of the directors of sslc board wherein i was mm -hmm. called i told them clearly see you only are the culprits and you only are investigating i am not cooperating kindly provide me the information the mm -hmm. information is denied on a simple on a simple plea that it is privacy i can't understand what privacy is there after the I mean, privacy is not at all in a SLC exam. There will not be privacy. I am not asking the photographs of the wife of the evaluator. I mean, uh, evaluator or the invigilator. This hmm. is very, very I mean, uh, disgusting. Hmm. Okay, please, please tell me what okay. what can I do? No, I think you've picked up a very important issue, and that is symptomatic of everything that is going wrong with our educational system. One of the symptoms. Right. and also similar things happen in relation to the recruitment process which our state public service commission also adopts so not a single appointment it comes through unless it passes through the high court to be vetted in terms of reliability of the process so this is the unfortunate state of affairs in karnataka which happens to be one of the better governed states across the country no doubt about that now you've done the right thing you've asked for the information and you are asking for that information which is necessary to fix accountability without that it will only be an allegation and there will be no way of proving it now there is a good strong possibility like you've already seen in two cases that the commissioners are not going to allow disclosure what do you do after that one thing is you put all of this story of your exertions to the media social media also that is one way of raising visibility which is necessary the other thing but, to do just inter but it, but it won't solve my problems so the thing here oh, is to to the there is time. there is a case yeah. where now i would i would appeal to the high court only that is only if you let me complete then i can respond to everything yeah, yeah, yeah you perfect i am not uh, okay yeah, yeah. now what you need to do is this there is no option but to go to the high court there is nothing in between the information commissioner 
and the high court there is no other forum but will you go to the high court alone yeah or will you take the students whose future has been adversely impacted by this scam that is a strategic call that most of us who work individually as activists simply do not bother to address mr fernandez i can say with 100% certainty that you never appeared in that sslc exam where the scam occurred was your too no no i i don't i am not appeared not only i don't have my I mean, my children or my both i have got <laughs> elder children they are all settled in uh, europe but what, what i want to do is see we have to okay. fight can corruption please finish please can i please finish please ha huh? can i finish and we'll come to it then we can have a have a conversation right now let me finish now you need to show your locus standi before the high court what is your locus standi you will say i am an rti activist i am a concerned citizen today we are not living in a 21st century india where these things are treated with the kind of respect and seriousness that pils were treated in 1970s and 80s you've got to recognize this your motivations are absolutely golden no doubt about that but you are going to go before the court you will have to show your like locus standi you are saying i never appeared my kids have never appeared so the court is going to ask what's your problem in life you are a busy body even if the court does not say it the board will say it the government will say it the standing council will say it so for you a strategy would be to get hold of some of those students who have been adversely impacted by that scam get them to be co-petitioners you say that look these are the children who are affected it's their future the court is going to soften down like anything on that and then you say that these are kids they are not able to do these rti interventions as a public spirited citizen i am doing this and this is the wall against which i have run so my lords can you take this matter seriously and do a court monitored investigation into the scam that is a strategy you have to adopt there is nothing else you can certainly you know you can certainly go to mlas you can go to members of parliament that door is always open they might even you might even be able to get, uh, get them to write a letter to the board or to the education minister quite possible now that is the political advocacy and because if i'm uh, not mistaken the scandal that you talked about occurred during the previous government now there is a change of government so probably there are people who might listen to you with a little more seriousness than the previous government did quite possible so do that but that will not really take you very far but to challenge your um the horrible decisions that will come out of the information commission this would be a way you will file one writ challenging the decisions of the information commission you will get the children to be represented before the court saying that our future is affected because of this scam and this gentleman is asking for information they are not giving it and this um, investigation that the board is doing on its own that committee and committee etc it's not going to go anywhere so that way strategically you build pressure yeah. okay i will do, i will do that i will do that please go ahead please go ahead okay right sir you want to say something else yeah Okay, I'll do that. Okay, thank you. Anybody else who has their hand up? Yes, Linus, go ahead. Sorry, I clicked it by mistake. Sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Anybody else uh, who would like to share their experience, like Mr. Fernandez did, where you asked for information and you got quite frustrated that the information was simply not forthcoming? And and if you all well, if you don't have a question, uh, you can certainly share your experience, and then we can use that as a base for discussion. Okay, Mr. Dilip Vas Naik has raised his hand. Mr. Naik, please go ahead. Yeah, your voice is coming, uh, reaching us in a garbled way. I'll explain a place where there's a lot of disturbance. Are others able to hear this night clearly? You I can put your question in the chat box if you want. Can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems to be a problem with your connectivity, Miss Nayak. 
do you want to enter your question into the chat box then i'll try and respond to it okay now maria magdalena almira diwales has put in a question can a department turn down rti application once can a department turn down rti applications on the ground that questions have been asked thereby terming the application as not correct but the appellant authority suggested that information that could be asked in the portal of the caring department what happens to those senior citizens who are not computer savvy and have no other help uh, now um, ms almeida give us you've asked a very very important question and this is something that many of us have struggled since the year 2006 because that is when these the kinds of responses saying oh if you ask us a question we don't have a duty to give you an answer that is what is you know coming up so now for that let me show you a case law where supreme court has said how to deal with something uh, that looks like questions so let me try and get that uh, slide up for you first of all let me tell you even as my powerpoint presentation comes to life uh, let me tell you that there is nothing in the right to information law which bars you from asking questions one second one second i was looking at the wrong presentation one second let me just get that out why did the second one not open up hmm. first of all there is nothing that bars you from asking questions because most of us don't recognize and it's important for me to to emphasize this point which is every time you submit an rti application to any public authority you are not exercising one but you are exercising two fundamental rights the first fundamental right that you are exercising very obviously is the right to information part of article 1918 so that is known but every time you write to government formally ask information under rti you are also exercising a second right to a second fundamental right and that is your right to freedom of speech and expression so they cannot bar you from asking questions because asking questions is not or, or you know is not a erroneous exercise it is not a wrongful exercise of freedom of speech and expression it still have to respond to it so therefore you have a right to ask now that is the theory or the academic side of it however in practice what has happened and that to with the active collusion of information commissioners rti applications which are consisting of questions they get now for that what you have to do is make use in the appeal stage this judgment of the supreme court of india and i'm going to share this screen are you able to see my screen now it says section 2f opinion and advice can somebody confirm if you are able to see my powerpoint slide yes we can yeah yeah you can see this is the supreme court judgment from 2011 in what is called the central board of secondary education and another versus aditya bandopadhyay and it sort of you know in a in a direct way it relates to the previous question which uh, you will have to just put it on the presentation mode so that it can be wider and uh, bigger for everyone to see thank you yeah but yeah. give me half a minute let us see if it goes up now are you able to see no it won't change like this you will have to uh, Stop come back to the google meet 
and then share that uh, window which is showing the slide this thing the slideshow yeah oh my now it's full screen on my screen but then when i go out of that it's no longer full screen so keep it on full screen then hit the windows button then come to the browser mm -mm -mm. that won't work let me try and increase the magnification would this be better makes more sense yeah yeah we can okay great so uh, you know one of the things that the public information officers say why they don't have a responsibility to give you answers to your questions is because they say that when you ask a question it amounts to asking us for opinion or advice interpret the information that has been given to us so in that context this supreme court judgment will be of use to you so what the supreme court is saying is simply this it says that information and right to information which are defined in section 2f and section 2j of the rtir they make it very clear that your right exists in so far as the information that you want exists with the public authority where you filed the rtir if they don't have the information then your right to information from that public authority cannot be exercised so if the information that you want is not part of the record of a public authority or is it required under any law or rule or regulation to be maintained by that public authority then there is no obligation on them to give it to you nor do they have an obligation to collect collate or give such all available information also a public authority is not required to furnish information which requires drawing of inference since or making of assumptions but at the same and at the same time you are also the public information officer also is not required to provide advice or opinion to an applicant nor is he required to obtain and furnish that opinion or advice saying that okay somebody is asking this question let's give him a reply no so the court is saying very clearly the reference to opinion or advice in the definition of information in 2f it refers material available in the records of the public authority so further they say many public authorities like a, as a public relation exercise they provide advice guidance and opinion to citizens this was in those days nowadays they don't do it 12 years later but that is purely voluntary and should not be confused with any obligation of the rta so how do we make use of this judgment to rest, to be a little more successful in pressing the public authority to give you information now every question that you are asking in an rti application which ends with a question mark can always be converted into an affirmative sentence and i'll give an example let's take my own example of that ban on rice exports i could easily have asked a question very simple way and said what kind of data do you have about the export of rice non basmati type for the last 6 months question mark no i did not do that instead i said please provide me a copy of all materials including statistics information or any study that has been conducted that forms the basis of the decision to ban non basmati rice export so i haven't asked a question i am using the very terminology given in the rti act documents materials records study reports etc whatever is available in your custody you have to give it to me so at least the technicality on the basis of which they will tell me sorry you are asking a question therefore rti is rejected that can be avoided so we also have to become shrewder sharper cleverer more intelligent in drafting our rti applications why give them the opportunity to deny say we know you so we don't have a duty to give you an answer so let us not formulate our questions in the uh, our rti uh, requests in the form of questions so that part of the problem is taken over and always make it a point to say 
give me this information as contained in your official records or you say give me this information in the form of a copy of the record or document this official document that you may have so this is what you will have to first try out and then they will be more hard pressed to say that oh this person is asking for information he's referring to official records so therefore we cannot say okay they are asking a question and therefore we are denying it the moment you put a question in your rt application you will know that in no time they may respond to you after 3 weeks that's a different matter but they will still tell you that you are asking a question they will not give you the information so try and avoid raising questions that is your first step safeguard second step is if they still tell you that no what you are like they can always tell you okay the kind of information that you are asking in our interpretation it is not information i have got those kinds of responses also despite the fact that i use all of these tactics saying that give me a copy of the official record that contains this this information they will say oh, for our purposes this is not information then i hit back in the appeal i say what am i asking i read back materials from their own website to them and say that you are supposed to maintain this information i'll give you an example now this is not where they rejected uh, my rti saying that we can't give you this information because you are asking a question instead what they said was this was election commission of india i was basically asking because i have been chasing the electronic voting machines for quite some time now so i want to get hold of what is called the first level check reports before elections are announced 6 months in advance or 3 months in advance all the evms have to be tested for their uh, functionality and every day a report is prepared by the returning officer in every constituency based on the machines that are checked by the engineers of the company so i said give me a copy of that and i filed the rti with the election commission here i didn't ask for making it publicly available he said give it to me and i want to inspect the file notings relating to uh, these flc reports first level check reports so the info, the election commission wrote back to me saying that look flc is done at the constituency level all those reports are available to the returning officers so you either ask the returning officer or you ask the chief electoral officer of the state we can't give you the information you have duty to transfer your rti also across the 29 states and union territories so that is where i had done my research i knew this kind of a response will come i'll have to tackle it so i read up the electronic voting machine manual called evm vv pat manual which is up on the election commission website this is the pre rti filing research that one has to do so i did the research and i found out that there is an annexure containing a pro forma in which the returning officer for every assembly or parliamentary constituency has to consolidate all the flc reports that are prepared in that constituency during flc check and give a consolidated report to the ceo that's the chief electoral officer with a copy to the election commission of india and how is this process to be completed is explained in the manual so i wrote up those pro portions of the evm vv pat manual in my appeal and i said according to section 2f this is information that is available with you according to section 2j i have a right to seek this information because it is held by you in your custody therefore i am challenging the pio's decision thankfully appellate authority has now said come and inspect although in order to save their face they have said whatever information was available with the pio they have given you but if you are not satisfied come and inspect so now i have to go and inspect because they cannot tell us that flc reports are not coming towards in consolidated form because then that would be a violation of the electoral rules election rules so this is how you fix them this is how you tackle them the pincer movement as you call it so this is what you will have to do a first safeguard don't ask for don't ask questions don't ask for information in the form of questions second safeguard be 100% sure that it will be available with them now in my rice export case i thought dgft will have it but no dgft said consumer affairs will have it now how was i so 
sure because in their RTA reply they said so. Now it's not because they don't have the information; it's because they are it's so political they don't want to disclose it, and they will play games. So this is why we have to be persistent. We have to be intelligent. We have to be persistent, and that is the only way of moving forward. And here, in addition to RTA interventions, what is necessary is for groups like you to focus a little more on compliance with Section Four One B. Now I know our uh, dear friend uh, Bhaskar Prabhu from Maharashtra. Dolphy knows him, Linus knows him, several others also know him. Probably not everybody would be familiar with him, but he is one person, one of the several, who has focused on getting compliance on the Bombay Municipal Corporation with regard to sexual disclosure, work orders, purchase orders, contracts, this, that, everything, rules, building plan approvals. He is constantly behind that four one B compliance. So the more you focus on that. You will not only be helping yourself; you will be helping a whole lot of other people in your area who might actually want that kind of information, and they will be able to access it without asking for it if the compliance is compelled. So that is where you will have to really work on this. Uh, you know, on section four, that would be another way of uh, making sure that the um, information they are not able to deny easily. Okay, then. Um, Next question is: uh, Can a party write to the High Court or Supreme Court without going legal? And get an answer. If so, get an answer for the freedom of speech. Well, Sharmila ji, yes, of course. Theoretically speaking, according to the Constitution, you have the right to petition any authority under government in any official language. Now, let me read out. that particular provision for you so that is not that is actually put quite innocuously in the official languages section of the constitution but frankly speaking it is actually uh, sorry it's not 311 article 311 it is uh, one second let me just get to it it's actually the right of every citizen to file a petition or a representation with the you know state with with anybody who is part of the state agencies one second let me just look for it so if you want to, to write to the supreme court outside of the right to information you have every right to do so please do it in english or do it in hindi and you know they will have a duty to respond to you Okay, okay, okay. I think I'm getting the mm, yes. So this is. Let me see if I can put this up on screen for you. One second. I I just looked at the hard copy. Now let me pull out a copy of the Constitution of India, and uh, you will be able to see this thing. Not many people actually pay attention to this particular. Um, provision of the constitution and those who do think of it only as a provision that relates to the language that must be used while sending a representation to the concerned authority under government so okay my constitution is up now let us see yes there we go let me open my computer okay there we are now let me share my screen with you window constitution there you go so are you able to see on your screen something which says chapter 4 special directives this is part of yes article 17 of the constitution which says official language so look at article 350 what does it say the margin note says language to be used in representations for redress of grievances and what does it read every person shall be entitled to submit a representation for the redress of any grievance to any officer or authority of the union or a state in any of the languages used in the union or in the state as the case may be now how does one understand it first of all this is about 
use of language so your representations must be in the language that is used please note it does not say official language it says language used so in karnataka for example there is kannada that is used there is english that is used there is uh, konkani that is used there is tulu that is used there is kodava or kurgi language that is used in addition to people who are from other uh, linguistic states there could be tamil there could be telugu there could be uh, malayalam there could be marathi etc etc so these are all languages that are used so there is no bar on using only the official language that's the first part you have a right to submit a representation for the redress of any grievance it is a constitutional right that is the second part the third part is it is not restricted to any government it says any officer or authority of the union or of a state so it includes parliament legislative assemblies governor's office chief minister's office supreme court of india high court of india district courts police department panchayats zila parishad government hospitals government universities you name it they are all covered by this so you may then tell me okay this is just about sharing a representation what happens to the representation obviously you may not get a response because that is how our government works democracy is in our veins no it still hasn't reached here because there is a blood brain barrier here so democracy is still coursing through the veins transparency and accountability still have to cross the blood brain barrier to become effective so for that you have rta you file your representation say i am filing this under article 350 of the constitution please redress his grievance two weeks later send a reminder if you still don't get a response file your rta and say on so and so date i have filed this representation to you under article 350 please give me details of all action taken on my representation please give me the names of the officers who are competent to take action on my grievance give me a copy of the files and file notings that have been created on the basis of my representation good question to mr naik are we mixing addressing a grievance with request for information no we are not and yes we are why because i straight away answered shavila ji's question can we write to the government using a freedom of expression so i'm saying now you are using your fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression like i said every time you send a representation you are using their fundamental right now when you send a grievance you are using a constitutional right under article 350 so it's a combination of both and then as a follow up you're using a second fundamental right which is right to information so it is all about strategic use of rti why because even after 75 years our governance has not really become as responsive as it should be unless you grease the wheels of the government machinery with vitamin m or vitamin i money or influence so people like you and i probably do not have either so therefore we use vitamin rti and we deploy the constitution to our benefit not many people teach these things in legal literacy courses i and dolphy i don't know if in the dslsa uh, trainings article 350 is talked about if it is not 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 really yeah so please talk about article 350 it is a constitutional right to submit a grievance to any authority from a sarpanch up to the president of india and then follow up with rtis so let's move on to the next question now um okay mr naik is asking dilip asna is asking this may be directly inappropriate no nothing is inappropriate don't worry a local lawyer says it costs 50000 to file a writ in the karnataka high court please comment yes 50000 might be actually a reasonable amount it might cost a lot more so then what do you do you look for lawyers who will take up public interest causes pro bono and there are several of them bangalore for example has a group called alternative law forum there are very young bright lawyers who take this and the kind of cause that you talked about sslc scam squarely falls within their domain of interest i'm happy to put you in touch with them 
I used to know them long back. Nowadays, uh, the membership there has changed, but I do know somebody who heads alternative law forum. So you might you know like to get in touch with them and explore the possibility of taking this matter that you are struggling with to the high court. So what is so that, that, sir? Alternative. Alternative Law Forum (ALF). I think they have a website also. You can just check it out. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. So then, uh, Maria Marina Almeida is asking: uh, Defense Department does not disclose information under Official Secret Act. Yes, but it all is a question of what information are you asking? Not all information that the Defense Department holds is covered by Official Secrets Act. Official Secrets defined in the Official Secrets Act. And that does not include any paper, any sheet of paper that is stamped confidential or secret or top secret. No, that is not Official Secrets. Official Secrets are clearly defined in the Official Secrets Act. What are they? Military secrets, defense related matters, important ones like strategy, tactics, deployment, weapon related information, sensitive defense installations, not the army, uh, housing colony in the cantonment area that is not secreted that is not official secret but things like for example uh, how many soldiers are deployed on india's borders with other countries what kind of weapons do they have those are all official secrets so therefore it all depends upon what kind of information you are asking and if they say official secret then you will have to find a way of countering that and it all depends upon the nature of internet you are asking and generally speaking i haven't come across a single case where people have used rti to seek official secrets of the kind that i explained and they have challenged the matter all the way up to the information commission no that has not happened i'll give an example sometime back in 2011-2012 government notified an organization called Strategic Forces Command, SFC. They said, this is like an intelligence security organization like Intelligence Bureau, Research Analysis Wing, CBI, Assam Rifles, etc., etc. So they are also now exempted from giving uh, information under RTI Act, just like other intelligence agencies. Now, believe you me, I work in Delhi, and I filed several RTIs with Defense Department on sensitive matters, not official secrets, but sensitive matters. Even I didn't know that there was something called a Strategic Forces Command because I am not a security analyst. It is only when they said that this body is outside of the RTI Act, I realized, oh, there is a body. So I filed an RTI. I said, give me all the papers, all file notings, which form the basis of keeping this SFC outside RTI. Very surprisingly, they gave it to me also. And do you know what is the question that was being asked? Because of which they said SFC should be outside of RTI. Somebody has asked, who has the finger on the nuclear button in our country? Now you tell me, should that be an official secret or should that be publicly known? There are arguments on both sides. There will be some people who will very strongly argue, no, 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 we can't tell people who's got the finger on the uh, nuclear button. Why? Because then there might be assassination attempts. Like the Prime Minister always goes out walking, you know, in car market to pick up groceries for his house. It's not that easy to break the uh, security cordon around the Prime Minister, which is there 24 hours. But the nuclear weapons, which will get activated by the nuclear button, of course, there is no such thing as a nuclear button. That is just a metaphorical way of saying who is the person who ultimately decides that nuclear weapons should be blasted. So that is the question. The, the, the uh, metaphorical way of asking is who's got the button, uh, finger, whose finger is on the button. Anyway, shouldn't we know for whose protection are the nuclear weapons being uh, manufactured and maintained and deployed in this country? It's not for just protecting the Himalayas. Himalayas are well protected. If there are no human beings on earth, Himalayas will be very well protected. Probably they'll be better protected than when human beings are around. Nuclear are essentially there for protecting people like you and I, citizens of this country, from an enemy attack. And the money that is used to manufacture them, deploy them, and eventually even blast them 
these are taxpayers money that you and i pay so we have a right to know there is a strong argument in favor of disclosure also so i would not say that this is an official secret so everything depends upon what is an official secret once i had asked for our nuclear doctrine air force doctrine army doctrine psychological operations doctrine because there were news items which said that air force army and uh, uh, central paramilitary forces will use psychological methods in left wing extremist affected areas for area domination and getting back those uh, regions under control so i said we need a you know I, I we need a copy of the doctrine give us a copy eventually of course when i made this information public there were some very dear friends of mine who called me an anti national they said i'm a terrorist sympathizer they said i'm against the security and uh, um, uh, safety of this country i said please open your minds before you open your mouths the fact that i had the knowledge that there is something called security doctrine came from our own government's website set up by the ministry of defense where the various security doctrines of usa uk france australia available in english were all uploaded there and older security doctrines of our country were also uploaded there so i am only asking for the latest ones security doctrine is different from security related strategy military deployment strategies and defense tactics they are two different things doctrine for example is in the context of nuclear weapons it is no first use that is a doctrine people have the right to know and that is what convinced the information commission when i told them that sir doctrines can't be kept secret strategies yes plans yes battle plans yes i am not asking for battle plan i don't want it i am not going to pick up a ak47 and go and fight on the border because i don't have the capacity and other training for doing that but doctrine is something that i need to know as a citizen of this country what is our doctrine they gave it to me today they didn't just give it to me it is up on their website so everything depends upon what is it that you are asking whether it can be called defense secret or not now let's move on to fred's question how does rti compare with the deployment of legislative assembly questions during assembly questions which are usually short in goa some mlas especially from opposition are willing to raise queries of public interest hence this route is also helpful i feel obviously uh, no fred yes it is a very helpful route no doubt about that whatever questions you think can be raised on the floor of vidhan sabha or lok sabha or rajya sabha please make the effort but there it is touch and go why do i say that there is a two step process number one questions have to be put through the lottery parliament that is a state of affairs i don't know about goa i can't say that karnataka also if i'm not mistaken it goes through a lottery why there are thousands of questions that are submitted in every session and government doesn't have the time to answer every one of them so they come up in a lottery so whatever comes up successfully in a lottery he will go to the concerned department to be answered and then there is another problem and what is that problem the concerned government department may not actually respond to the question in the way it is written they might change the question and that is completely a breach of privilege of the mla or the mp who raised that question government can't change the question but for the last few years that is also happening doesn't matter this obstacles if you are still able to get this question up that will be good and let me give you an example of how one rti intervention of mine actually became this is just one example there are several such examples where rti interventions have become parliamentary questions i did not put even one of them people read my stories and they told the members of parliament and the members of parliament raised a question in 2021 some of you might remember i had put data out about pm kisan yojana now the pm kisan yojana as you know is about giving 6000 rupees every year to eligible farmers in three installments of 2000 rupees each and it is a big media event whenever the installments are released you are all aware of that now for a long time i didn't even bother to probe it i was occasionally reading from telangana from andhra pradesh from maharashtra this particular way eligible farmers they are not getting it ineligible farmers are getting it so those stories were there so normally like i explained i have this habit of first doing some background research and then doing rti 
So uh, I asked around journalists. There is a PM Kisan website. So they said, yes, everything is very transparent and it's money that goes directly into the account of the farmers once they're registered. So there is hardly any scope for pilferage. There is no corruption, nothing happens. But then there is this worm inside the brain, no, that is not willing to accept things at face value. So I filed an RTI after reading the PM Kisan implementation scheme, which said that this is the ineligibility criteria. So and so person cannot get it even if they are a farmer. For example, an MP can't get it, an MMA can't get it, a government servant can't get it, an income tax SSE can't, uh, income tax payer can't get it, doctors can't get it, engineers can't get it, other professionals can't get it. In one family, one person get, can get, even if there are five brothers who are all farmers working on five different plots of land. No, per family, per household, only one person. So I looked at all of that and I said, okay, fine, give me state-wise number of ineligible farmers who have been given payouts. And I said, give me state-wise how much money has been paid out to ineligible farmers. And of course, pardon me, I didn't say give it to me. I said, I cannot find this information on the PM Kisan portal. Please upload this information on the portal and send me the URL. Because this is about implementation of a subsidy program and this comes under 41B. So initially PIO said, we don't have this information. And I filed a first appeal. Appellate authority agreed with me. Very interestingly, the appellate authority agreed. They said, yes, this is information that should be proactively disclosed. And they wrote to the National Informatics Center saying, please add these portions to the PSAN portal. They, should, they sent a copy of their letter also to me. And in addition to that, they said, until this is done, this is the data that we have about ineligible farmers who got PM Kisan installments across various states. And very interestingly, they gave me state-wise data. They did not give a total. So we converted all of that into an Excel sheet, did the total, totaling, and we found there were 20 lakh beneficiaries across the country who had been given 1,340 crores since the inception. I made the data public. Media picked it up. Every state, some newspaper or the other picked up the story and published it. English, Hindi, Kannada, local language, whatever, 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 whatever. And believe me, in the next parliamentary session, a member of parliament raised this question, saying that, is it true that there are 20 lakh beneficiaries who are ineligible? Is it true 1300 crores, crores plus has been released to ineligible farmers? So they use the RTI intervention without saying it is Mr. Venkatesh's uh, RTI. There are other cases where they've said CHRI, Venkatesh, They've said this, so is this true? We will not get into those details here. So here they just use the data. Then what happened? Government had to admit that no, no, no. The amount of money transferred to ineligible farmers is not 1,300. It is 2,300. Because by the time the question reached parliament, further payouts had been made. So from 1,300, it had gone to 2,300. All of this is not my, you know, uh, it's not a story that I have cooked up. You can go to the Lok Sabha website and you can find it there. This is the last uh, Lok Sabha, 16th Lok Sabha. 16, no, no, sorry, it's, it's the current Lok Sabha, 17, because 2019 is when the Lok Sabha got reconstituted. So my RTI is not from 2021. And believe you me, I was really, really very surprised when in some RTI training program, as a sort of, uh, you know, a kind of a memento, they gave me this book written by um, Derek O'Brien, who is the All India Trinamool Congress uh, Rajya Sabha member. And he has written on page 145 about this story. That 1,340 you know, crores of money has been wasted on eligible farmers. And now it might cost 10 times to actually recover that money because recovery proceedings are also going on. Payout will cost something, of course, to the government. Now recovery will cost even more. So therefore, this combination of RTI with parliamentary questions or legislative assembly questions is deadly. And I was told confidentially that after this RTI reply of mine came out and it went public, apparently in the Department of Agriculture in central government heads the role. He has given information. But the good thing is this. What happened after that? It is not just Mr. Venkatesh's victory. No. Because of the 
directive sent by the appellate authority to the NIC, village wise data and names of ineligible farmers started getting uploaded on the website. Now, I certainly don't have the resources or the energy to go and check village wise what is what. Even in my own hometown, I can't do that. I simply don't have the resources and the energy to do it. There's just not enough time available. But what happened? A gentleman, 24 year gentleman, sitting in Paschim Medanipur district of West Bengal. I didn't even know him until then. He read my RTI story published in some Bengali newspaper. He went to the website and checked that yes, data was there for his district, for his subdivision, for his village. And he started advocacy there. He pulled out all the list of people that were you know, shown as beneficiaries. And then he wrote to the district collector saying, this is a doctor, this is an engineer, this is an MLA. This person is not even resident in this village. This person lives somewhere else. In this family, husband is also getting PM Kisan. Wife is also getting PM Kisan. So please act on this. Did the government act? No. Instead, this boy was threatened. They said, we will beat you up if you come anywhere outside in the public. His father was told, we will boycott your fields during the agricultural season. We will not send anybody, so you, are, you, know, you can't even sow crops. And then life threats started coming. So what did we do? We called up the local member of parliament from the same party, which is the ruling party. And I said, sir, what is happening? This fellow is just talking, or he's acting, simply to make our national motto real. Satya meva jayate, truth alone will triumph. And this is the response he's getting. These are the threats he's getting. This is the um, uh, danger to his life. Thankfully, the member of parliament was sensitive socially. So he called up the district collector and said, no harm should come to this boy. In, instead, probe these allegations. So that threat got reduced. But villagers who were benefiting from this, we're not going to keep quiet. Now, why am I telling you all this long story? That when you start asking for information in public interest, which will affect some people's vested interest, you have to be prepared. This boy, unfortunately, it was his first RTI exercise. So how did the villagers fight back? They sent an army of women from that village, their wives, their sisters, their mothers, their grandmothers to his house. Very peacefully. No threat of violence, but pressure. How? The women went to his house, gave a dharna there and said, now you return the money to us, which we are coughing up to return to the government. This is democracy, my friends. People working for accountability, people working for truth and justice will be treated by their own fellow citizens like this. They said, you make up for it. But somehow the boy was able to tell them that, look, please understand, it's not just government's money, it is your money and my money, today is it in this scheme, tomorrow it might be in some other scheme. This is pilferage, this is wastage of public resources, please understand this. So he was able to convince them and now they have backed off and today this boy is treated with great respect. Why? The opposition started coming to visit him. They said, hey, you are doing very good work. Why don't you work with us? This boy said, no, I am not going to join you. But I am pointing out things in public interest using my IT interventions from PM Kisan he went on PM Avas Yojana. There are Ghotalas even in that. Then PM uh, Gramin Sadak Yojana, the rural road scheme. There are There is corruption in that also. So he's moved on from one to another, to another, to another, to another. And now the opposition people realize his worth. That is how he's built up his reputation. And let me tell you so far, he's not even gone to the media. All of this I get to know because he tells me, he calls me up and says, Bhaiya, aise ho raya, this is what is happening. Can you advise me what to do? So you have to be prepared. And that is why I keep saying, in today's context, do not fight RTI battles alone. Fight it as a group. File RTIs as a group. It's possible. There's a Punjab and Haryana High Court judgment which says, one RTI can be signed by 10 people, no problem. One person will take responsibility for giving the fees. And information will be sent to that one person. And all 10 people can put their names in RTI application. There is no bar on that. So make use of some of these kinds of strategies. Okay, Next, we see lots of PIOs and FAs are not trained. That's one of the reasons why the act has been delayed and uh, reply is not in proper order. I completely agree with you. 
let us say today we have trained 50 people in one district in Goa on how to implement RTI. Two days, strenuous, in-depth, detailed RTI training, case law based, information commissioner has come and spoken. So very good quality training program. One year later, you will see not one of those tra trained officers continues to be a PIO there. Why? They've all been transferred out. So the next set of people have not been trained. You have trained them. So training is a continuous exercise. And this is something that you and I cannot do. I was introduced by saying that, you know, 7,500, 6,000 or so, it's now become 7,500 PIOs whom I have trained. It is not even a drop in the ocean. It is actually not even large enough to fit on the um, tip of a needle. The number is that small. The size of a bureaucracy in our country is somewhere in the region of or even more. I think it might run into crores if you include the army and navy, air force and police and everybody. I was just talking about the civilian bureaucracy, you know, the government servants, the uh, the babus as we call them. That's somewhere in the region of about 40, 50 lakhs. It's simply not possible to train everybody physically. So you have to develop online training methods and that is something that we had worked with. Central government to make that happen, Hyderabad had started an RTI online course. First, they made it offline by giving disks to everybody because internet bandwidth was in those days. This was about 15 years ago. Uh, sorry, about 13 years ago. It was not as good as it is today. So they said, let's give CDs to everybody and they will learn from CDs. And then when the internet bandwidth became available, they said, let's do it online. And let me tell you, it was one of the most popular of courses run by the Department of Personal and Training. They ran it for three years and then they shut it down. No explanation given why. It was some basic information that RTI online training course was giving. Now they have completely stopped it. So therefore, it is also important in addition, in addition to the two things. One is keep the pressure on by filing RTIs. Keep the pressure on by insisting on proactive disclosure under Section 41B. Third thing to do is keep the pressure on to do trainings. And tell your administrative training institutes, like the one in Goa, one in Karnataka, one in Maharashtra, one in Andhra, wherever you are. There is always an apex officer training institute called Administrative Training Institute or Prashasan Academy. Insist that they involve activists like you in at least some sessions so that the PIOs get to know that there are serious people who are public spirited people who will find RTIs. Otherwise, behind closed door training programs, the only training that they get is how to deny information and how RTIs being misused by anybody and everybody. I am pretty sure even my RTIs are discussed in the context of misuse. But they do it with some respect, at least that much I know. They say, no, 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 I mean, this RTI is important. Whatever this. You have a forum, you have this collective collaborative learning cafe. You don't have to work across the state. Start working in one district on these things. Offer your services to do trainings. And perhaps things will improve. Next question, how, uh, this is from Easy Gracias. How do we check if the information given at RTI is correct? Yes, big problem. How do we check? We don't know. That is why I always give one advice. Do your background research. Be prepared as to what you can expect, what information that you should be getting. And only ask for such information that you can make use of. What does make use of mean? Two things. One is, you can make use of that information for some personal grievance or somebody else's personal grievance, your own or somebody else's, that is fine. That is a good use. Irrespective of what people tell you. Oh, RTI is being used only for selfish purposes. Nothing in RTI Act bars you from using it for your personal reasons. No problem. Go ahead. Second way of using it is in public interest, exposing corruption, mismanagement of public funds, misallocation of public resources, corruption, etc. Et so in such a situation, always ask for information which you can verify for the, at the ground level. Only then will it be useful. Otherwise, it wouldn't be of any use. At the most, you might be able to get some media coverage for that. So always ask for information that you are able to cross verify. And if you have some doubt about the information that you've received, authenticity or whatever, then the only way of challenging that, like a series of high courts have said, Andhra High Court has said that, Delhi High Court has said that, uh, some other high court has said that, that you cannot challenge the authenticity under RTI. The challenge will have to happen in other laws. You will have to go to court for challenging the authenticity of the information if you are not able to verify it yourself. 
So that is all the preparation that you will have to make if you think that the information that you get may not be really authentic. Now let's move on. Okay, Fred's asking question. Uh, friend and I had tried raising an RTI about the repeated crashes by CRE appeals. Yes. Initially, we were told that there was secrecy over these issues, but when we went again, maybe agreed and shared the information. So he's given the link. Fantastic. Absolutely right. People have a right to know why. That the plane that is crashing is something that we've paid for. God forbid if a pilot is dying or getting injured in that incident, that is our own brother and sister. Family is entitled to compensation. The person, if he survives, is entitled to compensation, depending upon how the, well that person recovers. All of this is public money. And for whose defense is a CIR maintained? It's for people's defense. So we have every right to ask these questions. Don't ask for where it is deployed or deployed. Why? Because then there might be a security related sensitivity around it. Sensitive information, deployment. If enemy gets to know, they will misuse it. Understandable. But how many are crashing? Like most recent example, I'm glad this question came up. F-35A of the US Air Force, training aircraft. Pilot bailed out, bailed out because of some engine trouble. And then nobody knew for more than 24 hours, where did that plane go because it was on autopilot mode. Now, finally, apparently they've discovered it that it has crashed somewhere. People have the right to know what was the reason for the crash? What was that engine trouble? What if proper maintenance is done? You see, just like commercial aircraft, even for defense aircraft, before a flight can take off for any sortie, its fitness has to be checked and certified. That is a minimum requirement. Why? People's lives will be in danger if that is not done. So what the engineering team, the ground staff has to do is certify to the fitness of the aircraft to fly. Do they do it or not do it? It's a public interest question. You should be asking and they should be making the information public. Anyway. Is there an easy to use user guide on RTI? Yes, I'll be, uh, there are several. Uh, what I can do is uh, I can uh, post a link to our uh, own CHRI's RTI user guide. It's from 2018. We are now trying to uh, update it because a couple of amendments have happened. So as and when you know that is done, I'll send you the, uh, the latest version. I'll send it to Dolphy and Linux and they can share it with you and also Fred, of course, I'll share it with them and then you can uh, use it. But right now I'm trying to get the link and I'm speaking to you. So the moment I have the link, I will post it on the chat box. So until then, let's one sec, let me just type it in. One moment, just give me a moment. Okay, found it. So I think in a moment's time, I should be able to post the link on the chat box. Okay, there you go. Good. So I'm posting the link. You can click on this and you can download the RTI user guide available at this link. Okay, there you are. Oh, Fred's already put it up. Yes, of course. This is exactly the one. Uh, no, 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 Fred. Well, what you have is an old one. The latest version is what I have put up right now. Okay, because we've done several editions of this, so 2018 is the latest one. Okay, let's move on to the next question. I would like to know the duties and jobs undertaken by local corporator of Elward and funds utilized without my name being disclosed so that I'm not facing anything called. Is it possible? What is the procedure? Yes, of course, it's possible. But you cannot file RBT applications anonymously. So you'll have to get a friend or a colleague or some family member to file the RTI application for you because under the Indian RTI law, Anonymous questions are not permissible. 
anonymous RTI applications are not allowed. Thus, cooperative host user ID command RTI that is installed usually refuse to respond RTI on the grounds of not applicable to CHS. Yes. Now, this is uh, the situation as it was until 2013. Uh, sorry, uh, after 2013 until about three or four years ago. Then, in this case that came from Kerala called Talapalam Service Bank, Cooperative Service Bank. So, Talapalam Service Cooperative Bank was the state of Kerala. Supreme Court of India said that all cooperative societies or cooperative banks automatically do not become public authorities. And they said that the burden of proving whether a cooperative society is covered by RTI or not is on the RTI applicant. Thankfully, a few years later, it was sometime, I think in 2018 or 19, five or six years later, in the DAV public school case, the same Supreme Court, but another bench, they said that no, every cooperative society will have to be tested against the criteria for public authority. If it is substantially financed or controlled by government, then it will be covered by RTI. If it is directly, you can ask information from them directly. But if they are not substantially financed or controlled by government, then you can ask the information from the deputy registrar of societies. So if the society's registrar is saying, or the cooperative you know, sector registrar is saying, oh, they are not covered by RTI, so of course, doesn't matter. They still have to file information with you. And that information we have a right to ask. So you make a call, you take a call on what can be given or not, what cannot be given, and we will escalate the matter to the information commission if you are not satisfied. So beyond this, I can't really say anything much because the RTA queries are not very specific, are not specifically mentioned at all. Therefore, I can't uh, answer beyond what I have said so far. Then Maria's question: How can information be obtained effectively from the portal of a department? I am not able to understand this question. Can you please clarify what do you mean by portal? Are you talking about a web portal? You want to turn on your mic and speak and clarify this question? Yes, she means the web portal. Okay, a web portal. Uh, well, whatever is there, if it can be downloaded, you can certainly download it. But if something, some information is not there, and if you think it comes under Section 41B, you can always file an RTI and say that this information should have been made publicly available under Section 4, but I can't find it there. So please put this up on the website and send me the URL. Chances are they may not update the website, they might send you the information. That's happened in many of my cases. Then Mr. Knight's question, is the Commission of Police Office not supposed to have statistics about road accidents? Yes, of course they do. Bangalore uh, Commission, Police Commissionerate publishes road accident statistics. Um, Delhi Police Commissionerate publishes road, assistant, road uh, accident statistics. If your commissionerate is not doing, then you can you know, probably um, um, write to them. You see, one thing is the RTI. You can also do your advocacy without mentioning RTI or calling it an RTI application. You can tell them and say that, look, Bangalore Police Commissionerate regularly publishes accident data. Government of India compiles all the accident data across states and police commissionerates and publishes it every year in Crime in India report. There is a separate uh, uh, report that they come out with. I think it's called Accidents and Suicides in India. That is also given commissionerate wise across about 32 cities. So you say that please give me the information according to this. So when you read it back to them, no, give this information back to me because you are supposed to collect it and make it public. Others are doing it. Then your case can get strong. Who is responsible for monitoring the performance safety of our roads? It all depends upon under whose charge the roads are. If it is NHAI, then they are the ones responsible. If it is city roads, then you will have to ask who has uh, custody of the roads in terms of upkeep. Is it the VWD department or is it the uh, municipal corporation? So you do that basic ground level research and then you ask them for the data. Okay, Anthony, no, no, no. First, let me finish all these questions that are coming in a text box. I know people have raised their hands. Let me finish this and then come to you because there are some people who have asked questions, but they've never been, you know, they're, and they're asking for the first time. How is data protection going to affect the RTI? Well, it's going to affect very negatively. It's a long story, but let me put it across very briefly. First of all, 
your 81J relating to personal information will become a blanket category where any personal information can be denied. That is the first change. The second change that will happen is there was a proviso under 81 which said information that cannot be denied to parliament or state legislative assembly cannot be denied to a citizen. That proviso is gone. So that test as to whether information could be given to parliament which you are asking, that test is gone. Third thing is, now for all grievances relating to personal information, the data protection board that is set up at a central level by the central government, that will be the final authority. And the data protection law will override all other laws to the extent of inconsistency. So, if you want some information and that is of a personal nature and you think there is public interest in it, you can still argue because 8.2 is still there. This override clause is still there. That has not been touched. But what will the information commission do? Central level or state level? Which is here in the case. That is still unclear. Do they have to take the data protection board's um, permission to disclose this information? Do they have to consult? There is no clarity. So until the government clarifies it or until the matter reaches the Supreme Court, there will be no clarity about this unless high courts say something on this. Yeah. But let me tell you, data protection law today has only been enacted and published in the Gazette. What does it mean? Both houses of parliament passed the law, president signed on it and government published the text of the act in the Gazette. It has not yet come into force. Section 2, 1, uh, sorry, section 1, 2 of the data protection law says very clearly that the government shall bring it into force at some date as it may specify either wholly or in installments. So until that happens, even though RTI Act has been amended, the amendments have not So 81J will still have to be applied just the same way as it exists today, as if the amendment had simply not happened. So the public interest override, the privacy protection, unwanted invasion of privacy, all those harm tests, they are all still there. So if somebody says no, under data protection law, we are not supposed to give this information, immediately challenge it in appeal. Why? Because the DPD Act has not been implemented. <laughs> How effective is a <laughs> signature campaign along with <laughs> sorry, petition to a government officer? Certainly effective, but it all depends upon what is it that you are campaigning about. So beyond that, it's very difficult to run a certain. What's the department you refer to administrative training? It's the, not a department. It's actually <laughs> It is the Administrative Training Institute, ATI as they call it. Like Karnataka's institute is in Mysore. Delhi's institute is near Karkarduma. Central Government Training Institute, there are at least two of them. One is in, in Masuri, Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy. <coughs> Sorry, that is an ATI. Similarly, for the lower bureaucracy, there is the Institute of Secretariat Training and Management based in Delhi. In Tamil Nadu, there is the Anna Institute. In Maharashtra, there is Yashada. So these are all ATIs. So every state will have this kind of a administrative training institute, which does in part training on RTI, but mostly for government offices. They rarely conduct trainings for civil society or media persons. <laughs> However, now this is something where Dolphy can come in and enlighten us. RTI is a law, just so many other laws. National Legal Service Authority, State Legal Service Authority and District Legal Service Authority have a duty to provide legal literacy programs, particularly to people to disadvantaged and marginalized sections of society. So you can prevail, you can request, you can pressure NALSA, SLSA and DLSA to conduct RTI trainings for people because government of India has not invested in even a single penny in doing these training programs instead what it does is it used to give three lakhs every year to the information commission to do public awareness programs and then they would go and do half a day of speechifying programs no training speeches after speeches rti is this good but rti is misused that used to be the you know main message that would go out so therefore and now even though three lakh rupees per information commission those grants have stopped so if a commission does some awareness raising programs on its own Good, good thing, otherwise they're not doing. However, there's a lot of scope for doing RTI awareness raising campaigns, training programs through the legal literacy programs of the BLSA and SNSAs. So do interact with them in your state to tell them that, look, 
this is an important law a lot of people know about it but not enough so can you please conduct training programs for people in villages in slum clusters adivasi areas dalit habitats minority communities and you can uh, you know take up that kind of a cause which is the supreme court judgment it is cbse central board of secondary education versus aditya bandopadhyaya it's a case from 2011 you google it on, and you will find it on indian kanun you can also find it on the supreme court website it's from 2011 <coughs> if additional fee is dated on the mandatory 30th day whether additional fee is payable <coughs> okay now that's a very interesting question yes public information officer is mischief they will keep your rta application pending for 29 days 30th day they send you the fee request and that reaches you after 5 days so what i would suggest is this in such cases what you do is because you want the information you will anyway be paying the fees don't go and pay it in cash send it through postal order or bank draft or money order whatever is available in your state along with a letter saying i am paying these additional fees under protest and without prejudice to my right to seek refund of this information of this additional fee for reasons of delay caused in giving you the information so you pay up that fellow will ignore your letter in most cases you get the information then you file a section 18 complaint to the information commission and say that i was given this information very late 30 days were over so please refund the fees that would be your way of handling it strategically would you recommend engaging rta consultant in case one does not wish to file rta oneself this is session all uh, for filing an application you don't really need to hire a consultant what you could do is you could uh, write to one of these online rti filing services that have been developed there is one based out of bangalore it's called rti online.com or something you google it you'll find it so there are several such services some of them are good others i don't really know so they can file the rtis for you but they will charge you something like 100 or 150 rupees per uh, rti application that's possible um important points to incorporate in an rti application for a good rti application now i said some of this don't ask for information that you cannot make use of or you can't verify don't ask questions don't write long stories be very specific be very sharp and people like you who are well educated you must do your background research before you file the rti application and make the effort to find out which is the office of a public authority that is most likely to have the information with you and don't write an rti application in a language that is not the official language of your state if you know the local language you write it in the local language and send it off or you send it in english no problem uh yes fred has said in goa there is the ati is gipard yes it's a goa institute of public administration and rural uh, development so in many states these two uh, institutions the office of training institute and the uh, the rural development institute are combined tripura is the same case uh, in uh, bihar it is the same case so no bihar is not jharkhand it is the same case so they are combined so they are the ones who do trainings okay so we have exhausted all the questions in the text box now there are some hands up as i Hasan and this, please go uh, and ask a question. So I don't, I mean, go as in not go out of the meeting, but please go ahead and ask a question. Hasan, sir, you uh, told that the Supreme Court judgment. Yeah. Okay, okay. It's Central Board of Secondary Education versus Aditya Bharat Padhyaya, uh, two thousand eleven case. Okay. Okay. Any other question? Hmm. Mr. Naik is saying RTI filed in English replies in Kannada difficult to digest. Please recommend a remedy. Find a translator. That's all I can say. Because the government does not have a duty to give you a reply in a language that is not part of their official language. Translation is something that you will have to manage. However, if they give it to you in a language other than the official language of the state, then there is a Uttarakhand High Court judgment which says no. you can't give a reply in english when the language of the state official language of the state is hindi translate and give it so there is a uttarakhand high court the reverse is not possible 
like you cannot ask for information in marathi or english if they are not maintaining it in english so that is a dilemma that we have like in sri lanka every official record has to be maintained in three languages english sinhala sorry sinhala tamil and english so there you can expect to get it in either of those three languages but not in india but there are still some very helpful pios like for example in gujarat particularly the police department and also punjab we file rtis in english they send back a reply in uh, the gujarat in gujarati or in punjabi but at the bottom of the reply they put a gist of the reply in english that's very sweet of them they don't have a duty to do that but some of them do it so therefore we know what exactly is being uh, is what the response is like and then what we do is we go to a language expert and sit with them <coughs> and get the whole thing properly understood so mr nayak you are based in bangalore there is no dearth of kannada speaking people there so i'm sure some of your friends will be able to help you understand what is contained in the reply any other questions so if there aren't any dolphy then shall we yes uh, i think uh, this has been a very exciting and a very insightful interactions with a lot of questions that have come in uh, which is remarkable i think there has been a very high level of participation also with very accelerating responses out of uh, your experiences in dealing with the subject uh, so thank you friends and i would like to thank venkat in very particular because every time i hear him out i learn new things so thank you so much and i think nobody was going to propose a vote of thanks anyway but thank you all my friends for being there till the end practically all those who joined in except a few moved out but practically all of you have stayed back you're almost on the dot of 75 uh, and i know that you will still have several questions in your minds and maybe we'll have follow up sessions also uh, thank you savio thank you frederick and thank you linus venkat thank you very much okay as usual a reservoir of information and there's something i always pick up now i'll have to sit down with dolphy and look at 350 seriously okay thank you dolphy for moderating the thing father melvin thank you very much for the clc opportunity frederick for the continued support and our man behind the scenes savio dies for handling this thing behind even sending the messages and thank you for participants for waiting with us so long uh, pauline has raised a hand she has a question i don't know yes pauline you can raise your question pauline you raised your question uh, hand so you have a question please ask the question she's muted so she'll have to unmute herself and speak <laughs> yeah sorry sorry can you hear me i'm sorry i missed on this i think it was very informative you can hear and, but uh, i think the last moment whatever i got i think it's it was very interesting i'm sorry i missed it you will have more more opportunities in the future <laughs> yeah uh, don't worry so pauline don't worry we are going to upload it in some time yeah it's very informative thanks a lot but okay take care bye everybody have a good night and good night good night, good night. night. Thanks, Linus. Bye. Thanks, Sadio. Bye, bye, bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, bye. Thank you very much. It's a very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.